start up in pinball and the license. No, no, Jody came afterwards. Jody's the youngest of us all. But I, before coming in here, I did a little research, and I came up with the number 3,748. And you want to know what that was? They all had a trading card first from Walter Day. Tom is number 807. <laughs> Roger is number 841. And Jody, you're number 2100 on your first card. Put them together, 3,748. So we have some legends up here. And, and the topic today is all about licensing. How did that change pinball and pinball development? And um, you're all familiar with the panel. Uh, Tom uh, worked with Bally Manufacturing, let me get it, from 1972 to 1986. Is that correct? If you say so. And is rumored to be the person who introduced licensing to pinball machines back in the day. That's, That's a rumor. If Roger says so, it's it. <laughs> And Roger joined Williams Bally Midway in 1988. You worked through to the WMS. Well, you worked to 2014 and then did through all the transitions of the companies, through, the whole, through gaming as well. And Jody joined the industry in 2009 until present. He has a special flair for musical licenses, and he had a connection into the musical licensing world. And we'll ask all of you questions about how these these different kinds of licenses have has, have affected the uh, the way in which games have been developed. So starting with you, Tom, considering you are given the the credit for was it Wizard Valley Wizard was the uh, first, first license first that you did. Wizard, yeah. Please tell us about it. Uh, it provided me a job. <laughs> 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 I I was I got a job right out of college. Um, 1972, worked for a couple of different Bally subsidiaries, um, Carousel Time and um, Alain's Castle. And then after those two, and I, you know, I was literally driving a truck delivering games at one point. Then I came in and I would say, God, this game's shitty in this location. The manager's a jerk, cuts the cord. So I said, you should move, take this equipment out of there and move it over there. Well, they had never had anybody like tell them that from the street. And so I started moving equipment around, and they believed me, which is the astounding part. <laughs> so I, I was kind of managing the routes and stuff, and then an opportunity came. I got a call to go to Bally Corporate Headquarters and um, meet a couple different people, and, and uh, Ross Shear ran the sales department. Yep. Was I think was vice president of sales yeah, and marketing. And uh, they gave me an opportunity to be in the primary sales office. I had Paul Calamari, who sold all the amusement products literally around the world. Bob Harpling, who sold all the gaming slot machine products from around the world. And I, they gave I stuck a desk in the corner. I'm sure those guys were real happy. Um, but they gave me all the, I won't use the word, the overruns. The games that were sitting in the warehouse because they hadn't sold. Uh, they just ran the, the run too long or whatever. And so they would let me package games and reduce prices and try and move containers. So I just banged the phones all day talking to the Bally distributors in the U.S. and around the world. And I'm, that was my job. And other than that, I'm reading Cashbox and all the other trade magazines. And one day I open it up and I see that uh, Columbia Films is going to make the movie Tommy. And uh, I was a huge fan of the original album that when it came out by The Who, the rock opera. And uh, I sat there and went, shit, that would be a great game. Wouldn't that be fun to have to sell? And so I brought it up among Harps and, and Paul, and they looked at me kind of blank <laughs> and went, yeah? They, they had no idea what Tommy was or who The Who was or... Um, Herb Jones, remember sure. Herb Jones? Of course. I mean, Herb was 103 when I walked in the door. <laughs> and, and they said, oh, go see Herb. Herb runs our marketing. In the door, creaky door. And um, he, he says to me, oh, well, let me learn, look in my file. He pulls out a letter, and it's from um, uh, Towser Music, Pete Townsend's music company that owned the rights to the music. And it, the letter heads Towser, which I didn't recognize the name. Oh, Townsend, Townsend. And in it, it's their request to Bally 
for could we use the name Bally? Uh, and here's the phrase, I thought I was the Bally table king. And, I, and it was buried, and, and he pulls it out of this dusty bin, and he goes, is this the one? And I said, holy shit, yeah. They came to Bally when they were writing the music. I guess they thought, I thought I was the Gottlieb table king, didn't flow off <laughs> the tongue. And um, so he, I said, what, did you give him? And he said, yeah, yeah, I wrote him back. He gave me that letter. He granted the permission, limited use, and all this legal jargon. And, and so that's why he gave him the green light. So I said, oh, dude, this is great. And, and so I tried to find, well, who do I go see? How do we begin this process? My boss was Ross Shearer who was three weeks, <laughs> he was down in Australia uh, at our distributorship down there. You know, so I'm not texting, but, uh, teletype, what's the old thing? I, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, trying to get a conversation. He didn't understand what I was saying, and he just said, go ahead, spend uh, a little time and less money. And so... I had no idea where you even begin. How do you get a license? And um, I called around and called around, Columbia, Columbia here, Columbia, Chicago, Columbia this, but but bum. I end up in L.A. on the phone. And s after probably a week or two of calling, I end up, and they, they put me through to an office of a guy named Barry Laurie. Barry was head of licensing for Columbia Films. And I talked to some assistant, and uh, and I said, uh, we're the world's largest pinball manufacturer, um, comfortably number three in the world at that point, <laughs> and dropping. Um, and and I said, well, you, that's, you say, it says Bally Table King, and that that. And Barry listens and listens and listens. He goes, I love it. Meet me next week in New Orleans at such and such a hotel and we can discuss it. And he hangs up, and I went, holy shit. How do I get an airplane ticket? <laughs> so um, I find how to get that done in the monolith of Valley at that point, and, and flew down to New Orleans. This hotel, Columbia Films, and I ask, and they sell it downstairs, and I go into a ballroom, bigger, much bigger than this, maybe two, three si times the size of this room. And it's the Columbia Films pitch meeting where they bring in all their distribution from all over the country into a, uh, I, I think they do it twice a year. So it was like ha six months worth of uh, film releases. And um, I asked for Barry, oh, the guy comes home, I'm Barry, look, greatest personality, shakes my hand, goes, God, I'm so glad you're here. I love your idea, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, my eyes are this big. So he said, I sit here in the back row. I'll talk to you later. And I said, all right. So somebody hands me this big three-ring binder, and it's all the information about their upcoming movies that he's, he goes up to the front, and he and his team present to the distributors the, I don't know, maybe six, eight different films that they were releasing. And the last one they got to was Tommy. I was so engrossed in this book, and this, oh, that's, that's going to suck. And, oh, I, this is a great movie, and, you know, now I'm being judgmental. And so he gets to, we're going to release the rock opera Tommy. Um, Ken Russell is producing it over in the, the United Kingdom. And it's The Who, it's Anne Margaret. Um, Tina Turner. Tina. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And, and God, he starts putting up pictures, and I'm getting excited like I'm, you know, a fan waiting to get to see the movie. And he's going on, and people are getting psyched, and boom, 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 we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And he goes, now, I'd like to introduce the executive vice president of the largest pinball company in the world. <laughs> and my first thought was, holy shit, Ross Shear is here. <laughs> and I, I do one of these, and, and nobody moves, and all these heads turn towards me. And I think, I think he means me. <laughs> and the walk from the last row up to the dais well, I turned it into it. You couldn't move slower than I did because I now had to think of a presentation. I, I hadn't, and I 
I had a lot of this stuff, but I didn't. And I walked as slow as I could, think, oh, we're going to do that. And I had heard a lot about promotions in the uh, the lead-up to this of all these other movies. Oh, we're going to pull in the radio stations. We're going to do that. So I'm, I'm picking up the jargon, you know, during the meeting, not knowing I was going to need it. Mr. Stern, you're late. <laughs> um, so I stood up there and... I have never spewed as much BS. But I, they're movie people. That's what they expect. You know, it's an industry built on bullshit. And so we're going to give away 12 biggest markets. And we're going to, you know, I'm making up the numbers as it goes along, thinking nobody's writing it down. So, <laughs> um, so I blah, 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 I'm getting my way through this rock solid 10 minutes. And uh, and that's it. And so I back off and Barry goes, oh, my God, that's the greatest. And blah, blah, blah. So I walk back to the spot. It, it, the meeting comes to its conclusion. And uh, Barry's um, uh, secretary comes up and said, Barry wants to have lunch with you. Uh, if you just wait here, we'll. we did. We went out to lunch. We sat at a table. He asked me what I knew. Um, what we were capable of, uh, and I just, I just kept speaking, and um, we shook hands right there at the table. We didn't have an agreement, but I would, that had to take place in L.A. and get a license and a, you know, the whole routine. But we went through, he, and he threw out ideas. Well, what if we? And the, the, the beauty of it was this: he didn't see me as a revenue generator. He saw me as a promotional tool. Hell, if I'd have played tough, he'd have paid me to make the machine. <laughs> I, I, that's not going to be. But he, what I'm saying is he wasn't looking for, oh, I need 100 k up front. I need that. No, 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 because I wouldn't have known what I could give him. And so the only thing I committed to that day is we'll cover, I think it was tw the 12 largest media markets. We would do it at the premiere in each of those cities. That's what I think. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I committed to giving him 12 games. As it turns out, of course, he needed one, and the three guys at Columbia needed it, uh, and the Hoon all needed it, and I kept saying you know, yes to everybody. Um, but I come back from this trip. I've got the first third-party license in the history of pinball, and it's the Rock Copper Tommy. And I got to tell you, it was so much harder at Bally to get everyone to agree that I did the right thing than it was with the crowd I just sold to who <laughs> didn't know me from a hole in the wall, clearly. And, and, and Ross here was, well, what happens if, and you know, I'm, in fact, do I know what happens if. We just, you sign the deal, we'll put it out, and I got a feeling it's gonna be successful. So that was the rock, the negotiations of, at which point then did they start to assign you to get more licenses for Bally? Um, not until after this game was completely done, sold. There was no discussion. You know, it came out. I went to the premiere in New York, and I did probably three or four of the premieres to make sure that the contest came off and stuff. So I ran around, and I get back, and and I think the first run was like six thousand, which is, you got to understand, Bally was making 2,000, 2,500. They hit three, they were static. It was a gold mine. And and so I think we, we did about six and ran out of parts. They, No one knew how to order that many pieces. <laughs> More or less make it. So I think we actually paused or we danced ourselves and then I think the number got to 10,000. Does anybody know? Does that sound right? You know, I think it was around 10,000 was the fun. But, I mean, this is a company doing four times anything they had done. They were four times their average. They had had uh, Fireball. Fireball yeah. had to be five or six, Yeah, probably. Definitely. Uh, great, to me, in my mind, greatest game ever made, Fireball. 1972. Yeah, and, and that license was with the devil. So uh, <laughs> made by Dave Christensen, I might add. So yeah. he was... Um, so we, we, this came back and I come back and it's like I'm on this drunk euphoric trip for six or seven months. 
Now, don't forget the day Ross calls me into his office and I sit down and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. You know, I was the the lowest and the low, and now all the people know my name and, and in the hallway they say, hey, Tom, and things like that. Um, he goes, well, that, you know, we, he critiqued it. And uh, then he goes, well, what's next? I said, well, lunch in about a half hour, <laughs> and then I've got some machines to sell. Um, now, I got to tell you, selling end-of-run machines mm. is a lot easier when you've got games like Wizard and Captain Fantastic and Playboy and things like that. It's amazing how we cleared out the warehouse. Um, 10,005? I stole the five, so <laughs> <laughs> I've got those. <laughs> um, so I cleaned out the... Not only was I this guy who came up with the idea, I'm the guy who cleaned out the warehouse of all the crap uh, because if you wanted a shipment of what? Oh, boy, if you could take uh, a container load of flip-flop and twin joker <laughs> <laughs> and I can give you a good price, um, maybe I can get you another container of... And so it it had multi-purposes um, of selling the, the game and selling all the other games, too, so... That's really how it came about. And oh, and so Roger, so um, yeah. uh, Sheer comes up and says, what's next? I go, I, yeah, I don't know. He goes, well, you better know that's your job now. <laughs> and I said, like, what? He goes, you better knock out as many of these as you can. So I talked with uh, Norm Clark, who ran pinballs and design and stuff. I said, how many of these big runs could we do in a year? I mean, could because we, we all had, you know, the the other games. Sorry, Mr. Padla, the other games. And, uh -huh. uh, um, I, you know, we talked about maybe doing two a year. And, and I think I only got one a year, maybe two a year, something like that. Um, and got busy and said, we got to do another one. They they said, that's your job. Your full-time job is now get the licenses. And... Being as lazy as I am, um, to me, the one personality that leapt out of the movie was Sir Elton John. And had fortunate enough, had met him and met the management and met the people who represented him. So getting a hold of them was uh, not nearly as challenging as it was getting a hold of Barry Laurie. And the weird thing is, they came back and said, yeah, we'll do it. We love it. Great idea. And I said, the boots and the machine and, you know, that that shot from the movie when Elton's up there rocking away against Roger Daltrey. And they said, sure, as long as we call it Captain Fantastic. And I went, yeah, sure. Captain Fantastic. You know, well, that was the next album. The double album coming out was Captain Fantastic. And they could see it so many months down there. They said, well, how many months a year? I said, well, we could probably, you know, get it out by so-so. Which just happened to coincide with the release of Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. Oh. And so they said, if you can call it that, we're in. Now think about it. The imagery belongs to Columbia Films, doesn't it? It was their movie set. He's in it. The persona in it is Elton John. And the record label is a whole different entity. Um, and I'm going, who, who do I get the license from? And then someone on the side said, if Elton John said he was doing this, nobody, including Columbia Films, is going to say a word. So we were licensed from the record label and uh, called it Captain Fantastic. So I had two brands. I had a record label brand name, and I had imagery that came right out of Columbia Films' movie. And I kept thinking, okay, if that's what you say. So they signed the licensing deal, we're off and running. And I kept thinking, do I call Barry Laurie and say, is this the right thing to do? Or keep your mouth shut and see if Barry calls me. And did it, never said a word. They never said a word, and we were good. So we used the Columbia Films imagery, as you all know, and then the uh, record label uh, titled Captain Fantastic. Captain Fantastic. Roger, now you, you, were a, you were a pinball kind of fanatic at that point in time when he was starting with licenses. How did you feel it as a player 
when they started to license games? And then what was your first license when you came into the industry? Um, well, I mean, as Tom was saying, it wasn't as if I was a huge fan of ballet games, <laughs> you know, way back when. God, <coughs> when I, I bought 5,000 hardcover books, you would have thought. <laughs> no, 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 that, that Tom did do. Um, the pinball book we did, uh, just as an aside, we did a special limited edition signed books in uh, Bally stepped up. Uh, it was 5,000 books that we did in addition to three print runs of the uh, the paperback. So, yeah, it became a good Christmas gift for Ross and distributors and all the other folks. Anyway, uh, I loved it. I mean, I thought that uh, the idea of having a personality um, to draw people into pinball at that point in time, you have to understand the, the phenomenon of the who – and the album and the movie with the stars that existed. Uh, the one side comment, and people know that I tend to go off on tangents, was, uh, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, and I think Michael's in the audience, but uh, Alvin Gottlieb, uh, who had seen the movie, uh, said it was the worst movie he'd ever seen because those are real pinball machines that were destroyed. And he saw all of those cascading down and he couldn't believe that they would ever do anything like that. Anyway. Um, Property uh, master got him. Yeah, right. But I, I like the idea that there was a, a theme, and in this case, obviously a recognizable one uh, when it came to the movie. The timing just hit just so totally correct, and it helped to elevate pinball. At that time, understand, at least for my background, for those who may or may not know me, yeah, it, it provided somewhat of an impetus for uh, pinball to get a little bit more in the spotlight than what the industry ever wanted, you know, kicking and screaming, wanting to keep their heads down and not cause any attention to them. So maybe in some ways it allowed me to enter onto the scene in a totally different fashion. And, and Tom mentioned Fireball before uh, when, when I did research for the article that eventually I wrote for GQ uh, and the result that happened with uh, the book. The only thing that I could find in the stacks was the uh, article on uh, pinball with uh, Fireball being the uh, the featured game. So so you anyway. You're talking about the Playboy. Did you have an article? Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Tony Lucas, mm. uh, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning author or whatever, had done this piece. So um, I think the visibility was great. For me, I'm still stuck in a world that I can't have pinball. So... <laughs> Anyway, um, you asked what was my first license. Um, I was at GQ, and I heard about a place called the Licensing Show. This is in 1987, before most of you were born. It was in New York City. Uh, it was at the Americana or the Hilton, I think the Hilton. And it was like, okay. And I used to go to a lot of different trade shows just out of curiosity of stuff and I went to this place signed in and I'm walking around and here are these small little booths for for anybody that's followed that business and I know Jody has been integral to it in so long um, it's now massive this was like a small little thing you went up escalators and off in a corner and here's you know Lucas films and and the the, the three the three properties that I saw just as a context um, Willow was going to be coming out and I thought, interesting. Who framed Roger Rabbit? Which I thought, hmm. But, you know, and, and understand the time frame. I'm thinking, the way she looks for an animated film, you know, I just don't know. And I met up with two guys who were really, really very nice. Young guys out of Vermont or Maine or someplace. Uh, Mark Eastman and uh, Laird. And uh, they had something called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And they had small little... I mean, it was a little bit bigger than this little black and white comic book that they had created. And I thought, God, that's, that's amazing. At that point in time, I had been reaching out to Williams. I wanted to start a uh, consumer magazine. I had actually done some magazine work for Aladdin's Castle and Jules Millman and whatever way back when as a side project. But I wanted to do a consumer magazine focused on coin-operated amusement games. And I presented a proposal to, to Mike Stroll and, and others at, at, at Williams. Um, also thought it might be interesting if they were considered because there had been this dormancy 
with licensing. Let's face it, pinball industry had fallen on hard times. The licenses became somewhat redundant and repetitive, whatever one might think of a particular theme or personality. Much of it, as we now know, is really dependent and reliant on the design. It's not so much just throwing a image back there. You want to have something that's somehow integrated. And I went back and I said, you know what? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles just sounds kind of like crazy and freaky. I understand this is 1987. They were just starting to push. Nothing had existed out there. I was two years ahead. And at the same time, I was also presenting a game design idea. And it was like, no, 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 not for me necessarily. I mean, I'll do it. And uh, they turned down all of that stuff. Uh, ultimately, obviously, um, Data East came in and Konami did with the video game. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has survived and endured. Anyway, uh, I get a call uh, March of uh, 1988. Uh, God, Nancy Goodwin was getting ready to retire. She had been the executive assistant uh, for uh, Luna Castro uh, and uh, was also heading up marketing. I got a call from uh, Marty Glazman who was the vice president of marketing and sales and Ken Videsna, who had just been elevated to be uh, vice president of operations, uh, asking uh, if I was interested in uh, becoming the director of marketing. And you have to understand something. Um, I had always wanted to come back to Chicago. I was on the East Coast, uh, but Chicago was where my heart always was. And to have something, and I don't know how many of you have ever experienced this, to have something that you really, really want and suddenly you have the opportunity to get it, it's not something, at least for me, that was a slam dunk to say, sure. You know, I got a phone call on Monday, let, let's take this. And it was like they made the offer and it was like, well, let me think about it. And I talked to Ellen about it. Um, eight years earlier, I had a chance to work at Williams and for a variety of reasons, personal uh, I, I didn't come on board to be Mike Stroll's right-hand guy. Ron Krauss got that position. And then there were other things. But um, Tuesday came, and I got another call from Kenny and, and, and Marty. Um, they increased the offer financially, and it's like, oh, I mean, it wasn't the money. It was just this concept of coming back home. And I said, well, we're, we're still talking about it. Ellen was open to it. Uh, she'd been out to the Midwest once back in 1976 when I got a car. She came out with me and we drove back. Uh, I did not get a call Wednesday. And my comment to Ellen was, I guess I blew it. And I thought it was done. Door was shut. Uh, got a call Thursday and I said yes. And moved from Connecticut, which was where I was living, to uh, to move out here. Uh, along the way, there have been rumors about, and I'm getting to the answer. Yeah, because I'm sorry. Because I think uh, Data East got the Teenage Mutant Ninja yeah, Turtles no, 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 no. license, if I uh, recall. Because <laughs> I mean, this directly correlates to not only Tom, but also to how and why we did licensing and my first license. So again, apologies. Uh, but uh, there had been rumors that we were going to purchase uh, Bally Midway, which I didn't believe at all. It's like, it's Bally Midway, for God's sake. But they had fallen on hard times. And again, the majority of what was happening was more, right, was more hotels and slots and whatever else. And uh, July 4th weekend, I'm driving out. And I think from Ohio, I made a phone call to Marty Glazman to say, hi, I'm like in Ohio. I'm coming. I'll be there next week. And he said, well, the rumors are true. We purchased Bally Midway. And my comment was, do I keep on coming or do I turn back? He said, yes, you have double the responsibilities. Anyway, fast forward. <laughs> fast forward, I get an inquiry from um, Eric Gardner. Eric Gardner and Mark Pearson at the time, uh, he was engaged to Cassandra, wanted to know if there was an interest in doing a pinball machine for Elvira. And they came to me and I presented it inside and... Neil Nicastro's first comment as president was, no, look at what it did for Bally Midway. Look at where they are now. So the fact that the company had kind of cratered a little bit, I said, yeah, but, and he finally agreed and we got started. And then the last point before we really kind of got things going 
was, what happens if she dies? <laughs> are you are you freaking kidding me? That's the first thing you're thinking about? So anyway, that was the first license. It went smoothly. Uh, I think that uh, Greg Ferris is probably in the audience, along with Jimmy, and we made a trip out for a photo shoot. And to show you how naive we were and whether or not Tom experienced this, so we had the finished art. Here's the game. And Cassandra's looking at it, loves it, but asks, is there any way that I can add anything? It, I had never submitted anything for approvals. <laughs> it was like, here, this is what we're doing. And I think Greg was able to put in I, uh, I heart Smarky, which is for, uh, for her then soon to be husband, uh, Mark Pearson. So that was the one change, but otherwise she said, yeah, no, it's great. And you learn as you go along that guess what? There are steps and stages that you actually have to submit stuff and maybe there's rights for music and other things. So anyway, that was the first license. Sorry. Thank you. I took too much time. No, you didn't. You didn't. And the only... I do know because I was sitting out in the lobby before you guys came on that there's some people here that have questions. So I, I want to make sure that I leave a little time at the Not end problem. so people can address, like, who's, who's the most difficult license person? You have to ask the right questions person. that would have shorter answers. <laughs> yeah. Either that or it's just me. <laughs> but um, I'd like to ask Jody a question. You, ha you came from the music world, right? When you, uh, yeah. When you so joined Stern? Musical instrument business. The musical industry. Yeah. But you have an affinity for, is, is his mic on? I, we got it? Yeah? Okay, they can hear you. Sorry, I'm deaf. I can't hear anything so <laughs> from the music instruments. <laughs> but when you are developing licenses, you know, you're not it's developing a gameplay to a script. You're developing with people that... Yeah, I started out so kind of... Give us your story. I unknowingly was doing licensing by just making signature products for artists, whether it be guitars or amplifiers and, you know, using those artists to sell more guitars and amplifiers, perception being reality uh, type of thing. So much like these guys leveraged uh, those things to sell more pinball machines, I would say, well, you know, because people want to, they idolize their idols and type of thing. They, they, they aspire to do things. So that's kind of, and I, I kind of unknowingly start, started doing licensing. Okay. Accidentally. Like I didn't know it was licensing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but when you do it now for pinball machines, how do you... How I still don't know what I'm doing, but I don't know. <laughs> they tell me you're going to be long-winded, and you're not. <laughs> um, but when you're doing the gameplay for a band, for example, do they, are they very involved? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, can, it can go from anywhere from just one guy loves it and it's cool, or the manager thinks it's cool, to everybody in the band thinks it's cool, but... To what you know, Tom was saying, and and uh, what Roger said. A lot of these people just want to have a pinball machine. A pinball machine is the coolest thing that you could ever have. You know, we've been told that once you have a pinball machine, you know you've made it. And so, I mean, what are you going to pay ACDC or Metallica or Lucasfilm or any of these people? That's you can't pay them as much as it's cool to have this cool status symbol, right? And some of these pinball machines over time have become so iconic. The, I don't know who was responsible exactly for the KISS license, but... Uh, Me for slot, <laughs> machines. Me for slot machines. Yeah. But, you know, and, and, and but it, that became, for every rock and roll band in the world, that became, like, the ultimate goal, to have a pinball machine. That pinball machine changed the way bands saw pinball. And it's just they think it's cool, you know, so... My first license for Stern was a, a music license. It was ACDC, and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, the first time I ever met with Gary, he said, what would you do? And he, said, and he was really mean. And he, <laughs> oh, he was so mean. And he said, uh, I said, well, I would call some of the bands that I'd work with and, or some friends that are, you know, Kevin Bacon, you know, one Kevin Bacon away, you know, friends of friends, and see who we could get, like ACDC or Metallica. Oh, you never get it. It never happened. It's never, never going to happen. And so I said, well, damn, that sucks. And so I called my friend I, who worked at the record label that ACDC was. I said, who's in charge of, like, if I wanted to make an ACDC pinball machine, who's in charge of that? So she sent me to some guy. I talked to him for, like, five minutes. The next thing you know, I was on the phone with the ACDC lawyer. And I made a deal with him kind of verbally. And then I walked into Gary's office. I said, I made a deal. I don't know what you want to do. I, I don't know what the, what do we do next? Like, what do, what's, like, what's the deal? Like, do you, like, is there a, like, do we have a lawyer? 
<laughs> and 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 uh, and of course, Gary said, "Yes, I am the lawyer." Um, and um, so I've studied law. At, Did you have to pay? Yeah, right. Pay Gary? Yeah, I had to pay Gary. Pay, pay Gary for for law lessons. Yeah. Um, but um, so I've through osmosis, I've learned um, fun law through Gary. And uh, but that was so that was the first thing I did. And actually, it was the first game. You know, when I met Steve, I see Steve there. And uh, Mr. Richie, you know, I can't miss you with the hair. And um, and that was the first thing we got to work on. And me and Steve have got to work on a lot of really cool licenses over, you know, and another, uh, you know, some really cool ones, Star Wars, Led Zeppelin, um, Game of Thrones, Star Trek. So we got to do a lot of fun things together. I'm a nerd as well. So getting to do all the other cool pop culture things like comic books and, you know, we, these guys mentioned Ninja Turtles. I've done, I did Ninja Turtles too. I, love, I, I was a little boy when Ninja Turtles was on TV, you know, so um, uh, Elvira, um, you know, all this stuff, stuff like that. So um, I'm a nerd and I like music, so it's kind of a perfect thing. You know, it's interesting. Thank you. Yes, We've heard it from all three of us. What this does is the entire industry is based on a push-through model. Yep. Manufacturers made a product and pushed it to the distributor. The distributor picked up the phone and pushed it to the operator. And the operator put it out and said, oh, Jesus, I hope they it's like reverse. it. And the concept of licensing absolutely reverses it to a pull-through uh, pull market. If I can excite the player, um, you mentioned KISS. We ran the promotion inside the double album that came out. And it said, uh, dress as your favorite character. Get your picture taken next to a Kiss machine. Now, we did that about 60 days before the machine ever went out the door. So you put the Kiss army out on the street to run to every location, arcade owner, and say, and he comes in, you know, in his Gene Simmons best, and says, where's the Kiss machine? I, you know, I got to get my picture taken. I want to win a machine. And the guy goes, what are you talking about? And he goes, hey, it's the kids machine. So he leaves and the arcade guy goes, holy shit, I better call my distributor. I need to get not one, I need six kiss machines, you know. And so it all went back up. By the time we got the machine on the production line, we had tons of orders. So it had never been like that at Bally. You know, it, everything was pushed out the door. Now it was getting pulled out the door. And that's what I think in a nutshell kind of oh, no, definitely. the idea even, does. Even LJ when she was at Williams. I mean, my real predominant uh, approach to licensing was what can you do for me? I can't reach the end consumer back then. This world didn't exist to this extent. It was all commercial locations. I can't advertise on TV and tell them where to find the game. I can't advertise in magazines, local, national, TV, radio, please, no. But if I can get somebody, Bob Denver, to come in to do recording and get him on John Brandmeier in the morning talking about the game coming, if I can get Cassandra on The Tonight Show saying that there's a pinball machine coming because she's always on all the shows around the time of Halloween, I can at least get some visibility. Or if I can get police force and arch rivals on 12 and a half million juice boxes of high C because people can potentially win this arcade pinball machine or this video game. Or if I can pull together for Bugs Bunny, not the greatest game in the world, 12 other licensees to come up with promotional packs that could go out the door so that the distributor had something as an added benefit if you buy this stage a tournament do some kind of a giveaway so that was always my premise rather than just having it be a one-way street so in some ways i think tom and i come from the same philosophy separated by a couple of decades and i know that jody feels the same way in terms of so much of the stuff that they've been doing as well inside the community as well as exterior to it because it's so critical anyway yeah, okay, just real quick, he, he just pulled Bob Denver out of a hat. Does everybody know who that is? It's Gilligan! <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> sorry. Not the singer. Sorry. <laughs> Bob Denver, as if. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, please, yeah. I'm sorry. It's not John Denver. I know. <laughs> well, I was going to say on, 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 like on a, today in 2024, on a new level of what Roger just said, yesterday or another day, we just released Metallica, and 
the, the the videos that they post on their social they have 36 million facebook followers 12 million wow. instagram followers so millions and millions of people saw pinball this week that might not have ever known about it and so that's the, that's why we do these types of things or like I do all these stupid projects. I make toys with other company and put our logo on it in the art, and oh, it's in Target. Awesome. And people go, "Why'd you do that?" And I'm like, "Well, the Stern logo's in Target, and so like maybe one day someone will be like, I know that, right?' Like, it's, it's so there's there's pinball's neat, so you yep. can leverage it to do neat things. Yeah, I mean, there's inherent value in in what we represent, both past, somewhat present, and much more present and future, uh, in trying to grow an audience. Grow a marketplace. You know, look, home sales are great, but commercial operation is essential. Not everybody is going to be able to go to Jack Danger's basement and play. Whoever he meets it, uh, who, who, whoever he sees at Jewel Osco is not saying hi. We'll help carry the groceries. Can we be here? I mean, you want to have the games out in plentiful numbers and accessibility and you want them on the street because gary this is one thing and again gary's a master of licensing and le- and and marketing as well absolutely him and joe camico and um i'd also say like gary always says if the game is not in the street and people are not out playing it and making fond memories they're never going to collect it in 10 or 20 years right so games have to be on location to c- produce the next because nice. that's why you guys buy a lot of people buy or do we buy that's why i buy a lot of toys because i my mom didn't buy me the G.I. Joe I wanted. So <laughs> you, you know, an interesting side note to all this is after we started doing these licenses um, initially with Pinball and then Elton and Playboy and everything, we got calls from prop masters in L.A. Sure. who said, hey, I need to have uh, three of this or this or that because all of a sudden uh, TV shows or movies – were working, they saw it as a cultural connection and said, we need to have these in our inventory so we can pop, you know, throw these in. Um, and they didn't want themed, they didn't want right, the license, the game, but they just wanted a machine that they could keep uh, in, in their possession. So we sold, I don't know how many, not that it was a good market, but to me it reflected a consumer shift that now it was okay for it to be in uh, a TV show, a six million dollar man, or s- some movie over here, um, as a background prop or in a bar or whatever, and then the more that happens, the more mainstream your product has become. We, yeah, we get those requests like weekly now, and it's some, and it's, I don't know, like there's not a, still a lot of pinball on TV movies, but there is now, and yeah. it, you know, it kind of disappeared for a while. I'd call the Bettelmans. And the That's complication right. with putting <laughs> licensed products in a movie is. You got to get not just only permission from Stern to say, okay, you can say it's a Stern pinball, but you got to get commission from Star Wars or Metallica, or whoever. So it becomes a little bit more complicated. Well, that's why they avoided they said. Yeah, but so now, but now I like I, now I'm able to bridge the gap. I'm able to call like uh, the guys at Lionsgate. Hey, these people want to put a John Wick pinball machine in their commercial, and right. people at Lionsgate are like, oh my God, really? That's cool. So you're able to bridge the gap. Uh, and they and then so that's I went through it too. with yeah, uh, my movie yeah. curating no, all the games. That's linked. It's so yeah. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, we're, we're, Sorry, we're finish, talking. Finish. No, it's great because we're gonna. We would like. We have a packed room, standing room only. We want people to be able they to must, ask questions. We've got ten minutes left in our <laughs> session. So who's got the microphone? Who would be the person? Is that would that be you, Jonathan? Will you? Oh, well, Steve's got a question. Who's the most difficult person you ever work with? <laughs> Luckily, I'm deaf, and I didn't hear that at all. <laughs> Testing one, two, is this working? Yeah. Said the deaf man. All right. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much to every one of you. Tom and I never were involved in a game together, but, you know, but I know you from know. the first days of Atari when I made uh, yeah. Superman. I mean, it was the second game I ever made in the 70s. It was like, you know, it, it was amazing to have one? a license like that. One? And, and it's like, I wanted to get more of them, and you made it happen because you did it first, and then we had to follow, and it was great. And um, and so I, I say thank you. I say thank you to Roger also for so many good titles. You didn't tell the next generation story, and that's a, that's a ball buster. It's so cool. <laughs> you, people need to know about that from your standpoint. And Jody, I got to say thank you to you, too, for all the good licenses you guys hustled for us. No question. Um, I'm grateful. I say thank you, and I say that with utmost respect. Thank you.
Thank you. I want to hear this. Anybody else want to say thank you? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, there's a question over there in the, on your. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So um, what's it like kind of dealing with more demanding licensees and whether they're, they're involved and whether that's in terms of involvement or strict demands or their standards, if you can go into that a little bit, please. Um, I'm sure it probably might have been, I don't know, I can't say it was easier for these guys. The the thing is for us now, you've seen our pinball machines, we have like a full-on television screen and we have full-on sculpts and stuff like that and all sorts of different things. It's just not, and not to diminish what an old pinball machine was, but an old pinball machine was a two-dimensional two art and some drop targets and some uh, traditional mechanical things. Now we're dealing with so many mediums. We're dealing with almost every medium that it's you could think of. It's easier now. Yeah. It's hard so to it's, entertain. In a two-dimensional world. Yeah. So it's um. But how do you deal with the Is that difficult right, licensing? Where's Pat right here? You um. You bullshit your way through it, like yeah. Tom said. <laughs> and I I tend to bridge both because of slot machines being a very visual medium. So the licenses that I've done there probably are comp comparable to uh, whatever uh, exists for pinball, other than obviously the mechanical parts to it. But you know I still have a screen and I have to draw people in. I still have music that I have to deal with, sound effects, the overall choreography of everything. Uh, I still need to get people in the studio and you know, went through the same process, dare I say, for video games uh, over the years as well in terms of getting all of the necessary assets and uh, getting the talent. I mean, I'll share very briefly, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger had gotten the first commercial Humvee and a jet plane to be in T2. I'm coming after him through his manager. He can get his own custom pinball machine <laughs> and a video game. Four legs. I mean, my God. I mean, I, I didn't know where to start, and James Cameron was wonderful to work with, as was Larry Kasanoff, and so was Arnold. So, you know, it worked out, but, you know, it can be intimidating coming from our side of things where, Maybe you have, in quotes, limited budgets, and some of these people, all due respect for what Jody said, some of them um, actually want to have a financial commitment of sorts. They'd love to have a game, but our legal department charges money. Our people have to pull assets in terms of the studios. There's going to be an expenditure that we need to cover. So all well and good that you're going to give us X games or you're going to give us X amount of money, but... And I think that those are the times where you have to negotiate hurdles as best as you can, and hopefully you're coming after people with a semblance of belief and trust, whether in my case or Tom's or even Jody now, all the years that I've been doing this, uh, it isn't as if there's anybody I haven't worked with or I can't get to. Yeah, and, I, and I think that that's where the benefits are, and for Jody specifically, in terms of his milieu, my God, I mean, People can reach out to him probably on speed dial and say yes. And even with Tom back in the day when you start rolling things out and understand something for perspective, Bally was the only company doing licensing. Gottlieb wasn't. They did some, but I'm just saying Bally was all alone. And suddenly, predominantly and preeminently, they went from number three to number one by a landslide. In a three horse race, we were number four. Yeah, yeah, basically, yep. And Solid State helped turn that around, yeah. as did the licensed content that they brought into the world. Because suddenly, do you want to get X, Y, and Z game from Chicago Coin, or do you want to get Rolling Stones? Well, uh, my God, yes. So there was inherent value for that location owner and operator to have something that was going to draw players in. In the question, I thought I heard who... Who was the most difficult, or did you have a tough time, or whatever? Uh, oh, I didn't hear one, that one. one of one of uh -oh, that's, <laughs> that's a good that's thing. Another semi. <laughs> one of my exercises when I sat down with a legal pad after Ross Shear said, "What are you going to do next?" I sat with a legal pad, and one listed everybody I wanted to meet that was a celebrity and cool movies and things like that. And in my ease, I had uh, Elton, uh, Elvis, and Evil. And I got 
evil, and I got Elton. And when I called and, and got connected to Colonel Parker and started negotiating with him, that man, he was going to take every inch of me. I mean, <laughs> and I was cheap um, because I viewed it as, I convinced other people to view us as a promotional tool, right. not a it. revenue generator. I'm not going to make you a million dollars. Uh, the colonel didn't see it that way. He and, was Dutch. Uh, boy, oh, was he? Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, he's a tough old goat, and he's the only guy who we got nowhere quick. And I said thank you, and I hung up and moved down on my list. <laughs> I'm going to turn the stage over to to Rob, who'd like to say a few words. In the meantime, yep. you're getting some chocolate and a certificate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's awesome. I want to thank all these fine gentlemen for coming here today. Um, it's been a dream of mine to put this together. Uh, I've always admired all their work. Uh, Tom Neiman and, and um, Roger have both been in the Hall of Fame, and uh, they've been here to Expo many times. And you know these old uh, guys have become relics, but but to me they're always my heroes, as well as Gary Stern and other people here tonight. But um, there's something I, I'm introducing new tonight, which you'll be the first to hear about it. So, LJ, I'll need your help. So if Roger and Tom would stand up, I have something for them. Gentlemen, if you could stand up. Keep your back to the wall. Yeah, really. <laughs> so I've created something for this year's expo, and um, I call it a Lifetime Achievement Award. So it reads, ooh. Hey! What it says on here, uh, integrity, vision, and leadership. And on the outside of the medal, there's a picture of who else but Harry Mabs, the inventor of the flipper. So, you put that on the Yes. So let's give them a round of applause, guys. There's more going out here in the next couple of days, so be ready. Hey, Elton. Back. You don't get away that easy. That's right. Can you see that? That we're in the 